Thanks a lot. It's great to be here to share some of our work on um, decoding the human microbiome. I understand uh, I'm the first microbiome speaker in this series, but I bet that all of you are familiar with the microbiome because it's uh, on the pages of our journals and in the public um, press all the time. Um, the latest estimate is that the microbes in our bodies contribute about 100 times more genes than the human cells do. And they're not just passive bystanders, they're integral parts of our organs, including um, the immune system. The um, idea I want to put forth is that the genes, the genetic material in our microbiome, interact with our uh, human genetics and are, are, are as important as our human genetics in understanding uh, who we are, uh, what makes us sick, um, and how we might respond to treatments. So um, I've only been working on the microbiome for um, even a little bit less than a decade now. Um, and there, as I mentioned, there's this rush of um, interest in it lately. Why is that? And that's um, for a variety of reasons, but one of them is that um, we have technologies through next generation sequencing to assay the microbiome to figure out what organisms are there and what they're doing in a way that wasn't possible um, even uh, five years ago. So. Um, for several decades, about 30 years now, it has been possible to profile microbial communities using targeted sequencing of specific genes. And a common experiment is to go in and sequence a phylogenetically informative gene, like the 16S ribosomal RNA gene, um, to sequence a very specific piece of that gene that varies between species and allows you to make a taxonomic inference about what organisms are present in a community without culturing them, without needing to know ahead of time who's there. Um, and this has been very powerful, and it's been used by microbial ecologists um, for some time. The more recent experiment that opens up um, a lot of uh, additional lines of inquiry is to actually just shotgun sequence an entire DNA sample and get um, a DNA footprint of the entire genomes um, present, not just a single taxonomically informative gene. And the coverage, the amount of reads, which I'm showing with these little black lines, of a genome will depend on how abundant it is in the sample. So your sample, like someone spitting in a test tube or a stool sample or a soil or ocean marine sample, um, is going to contain, in most cases, a complex mixture of different organisms at different abundances. And if you just pool all the DNA and sequence it, what you're going to get out is a, a mixture of reads from the different organisms. So this is more complicated, obviously, than studying a single genome, because when we look at the data that comes out, we don't know which read came from which genome or which gene inside of that genome. We don't know uh, how abundant the different organisms were, so we don't know why we might see more reads of one type than another. And so this is a big deconvolution problem. So this became very interesting to me about eight years ago um, because it, it seemed really powerful, but it, it appeared that there would be a lot of bioinformatic challenges and statistical challenges in analyzing this data. Um, so to reiterate, what we get out of one of these experiments, these shotgun metagenomic experiments, um, is a, a big text file. And a typical sample might yield something like 50 million 100 base pair DNA sequences. One could also sequence RNA to look at the gene expression. That has additional challenges, which we can get into a little bit later or in the questions. Um, but for now, let's think about it as DNA. There's metaproteomics, where instead of doing a sequencing experiment, you do a mass spec experiment to quantify proteins. Um, and metametabolomics, where you do a mass spec experiment to try to understand the small molecules that are present. All of them have this feature of being uh, a mixture of data that's coming from different organisms and not requiring that you be able to culture or isolate the individual organisms that are there. So given this file, this big text file, and say given a bunch of them from different samples, um, one might want to ask some really basic questions like who's there? And what are they doing? What functions are encoded in, in one microbiome and maybe not in another? And then try to associate those with ecologically relevant variables, the health of the patient from which they came from, just like we would with human genetic data. So 
Um, this sounds straightforward, and conceptually it is. And the topic of the talk today is, is, is the complications that arise when one tries to do this, and some initial solutions that we've come up with. So the first step for most analyses is to take these sequences and um, either compare them to each other and or to a database of things we've seen before. When you're comparing to a database, it's typically a, a collection of genomes and or gene sequences. And you do some sort of homology search. So you're asking if the sequences look like anything you've seen before. And um, the output of a search like that would be the count of reads that are classified to a gene or to a genome. And um, I'm not going to talk a lot about that classification. This problem's been looked at in single genome situations outside of metagenomics. There's a huge literature on homology searches, when different techniques are more sensitive or specific. Um, and, and this part isn't a lot more complicated in a metagenome than in other settings, except that your database needs to contain multiple organisms and you want to have some specificity in some cases to get the organism correct, not just the gene. But Let's say you have this collection of reads classified to genes or to microbes. The question is, how would you compare that? How would you compare it across genes or across microbes? Now, we know if you think of a single organism and an RNA sequencing experiment, for example, you know, you have some intuition or experience probably that, um, and, and you heard from Sandrine Dujois, I think, about this recently, that um, you need to think about normalizing for things like the size of the sequencing library. If I sequence twice as much on one sample as another, I'm going to get more reads classified. Obviously, I need to account for that. And I need to account for the length of genes. In an RNA-seq experiment, a really long gene is going to get a lot more reads mapped to it. It doesn't necessarily mean it's more highly expressed. So that's why people use statistics like the um, reads per kilobase um, or uh, FPKM, RPKM, CPM, these sort of statistics you might have heard of. So those, all those issues apply here with DNA or RNA metagenomics. Um, but there's a complication on top of that that the, we don't know exactly what the gene length is from any given organism. We could infer that um, from examples of that gene we've seen before, and that works OK. More importantly, we don't know what the size and content of the genomes of the organisms are in our sample. And that's a huge problem that we're going to talk about more today. Another issue comes up, which is how to compare across samples. So you, if I can normalize the genes within a sample so that they're comparable to each other, that's great. But in many cases, what I really want to do is get a lot of samples, say, from sick and healthy people or from different environments and make comparisons. And the question is whether these quantifications of the amount of a particular gene or of a particular microbe would be comparable across samples. And um, I wasn't too worried about this when we started working on metagenomics, but we quickly came across some really striking examples that told us that there were some major problems. So I'm going to share a couple of those motivating examples or observations that we made with you to show you um, how we came to realize that this was super complicated. OK, so here's the first one. Um, what I'm showing you here is some data from uh, Ruth Lay's lab, where she looked at um, uh, seven lean individuals and 12 obese individuals and measured the amount of different bacterial um, phyla in these, in these people and found that the obese individuals had statistically significantly more of this phylum firmicutes than, other, than the, the lean individuals. After she did that study, there were follow-up studies, some of which, like this, these uh, three um, populations that Peter Turnbow studied, labeled TURNB, and then that were aimed at looking at the obesity question, and then several much larger cohort studies that were just looking at indi random individuals but had some lean and obese indiv people in their studies. And we made um, did a meta-analysis of all this data to ask whether the striking observation that Ruth made held or not. And we saw two things, which you can probably see too in these box plots. The first one is that there's an inconsistent association between obesity and the phylum composition. So the, the amount of firmicutes isn't really a good biomarker for obesity across the studies. In fact, in some of the larger studies on the right-hand side, if anything, the trend maybe goes a little bit in the other direction. Um, 
The thing that troubled me more when I saw this plot initially, though, was that there's a huge difference in the amount of this phylum across the different studies, ranging from in like around 80% of the bacteria detected in the purple study to more like 20% or less in the pink one. So um, that made us think that a couple things were going on. One was that a phylum level biomarker for a disease, while it's really compelling and would be awesome if it existed, is probably not um, something that we can hope for and that we need to look at finer resolution to find associations with disease. The second one, um, at least in population-based studies like this in the human microbiome where there's a lot of noise and other factors. The second idea that this gave us was that there might be some bias that was creating this trend across studies of really different amounts of this, what appeared to be a very prevalent phylum being really low on average um, in, another, in other studies. So that's, that's the first kind of striking observation that we made, that there's some things going on that one wants to think about. Now, you may know the literature on obesity in the microbiome. There's some really nice functional work that shows that you can take stool from an obese mouse or an obese human, transfer it to a lean mouse, and transfer some of the metabolic traits and the weight gain to the mouse. So there is some sort of connection between obesity and the microbiome. Um, but uh, this biomarker of the amount of this particular phylum doesn't seem to hold up, at least in an uncontrolled, outside of sort of a controlled laboratory experiment. Here's the second troubling observation. So um, we were looking at individual genes and trying to figure out if they were associated with diseases. Instead of trying to find a microbe, what's the microbe? We asked what's the function or the genes that might be associated with disease. And we did this for um, a number of different diseases. And this is just one example. With Crohn's disease, we asked which um, genes had the biggest difference in levels in these metagenomic samples between Crohn's disease and healthy control individuals. And what was at the top of our list was the bacterial ribosome, tRNA charging, central carbon metabolism, a whole bunch of housekeeping genes, some of which we know in the case of bacteria, components of bacterial ribosome, we know they're a single copy in every single cell. So we know that they, bacterial cells, so we know that they shouldn't vary between samples. They can't. Um, at least in all the genomes that we've seen so far, they're present at one copy. So there should be no difference between samples. So what's going on here? This um, got us thinking about why these really abundant and, and common genes would be at the top of the list. The th thought we had when we saw that immediately was that when you go and you sample in the sequencing experiment, things with high means, high abundance, when there's a lot of it in the sample, is going to be more variable. Um, if you're familiar with the Poisson or the negative binomial distribution, these describe um, a process like s grabbing sequences off of a sequencer, and the mean is correlated, uh, the variance is correlated with the mean, so higher means mean higher variance. And when you have a small sample size and a high variance, you can get an association just by chance. Things are just noisier, and you could just happen in your sample to have a bit more in, say, the Crohn's disease group. So that might be what's going on here. There might be something else. That was one idea we got from that. All right, here's the third thing that I thought was pretty bizarre, and we participated in this study. Um, but I, I never really, um, this is from the Human Microbiome Project, and I never really believed it, or you know, I just thought there had to be more going on. So what we saw in these um, plots, I'll tell you, um, are on the top, the taxonomic composition of about 300 people's stool microbiomes, and on the bottom, the functional composition of them. There's a tiny column for each person, and the abstract bar plot where the colors represent different types of microbes in the top plot and different types of biological pathways on the bottom plot. And um, what you can immediately see is that there's huge variability in the taxonomic profiles where this phylum, and this is the Firmicutes here, is very abundant in some people and very rare in other people. But despite that, they seem to have a, their microbiome seem to be doing exactly the same thing. They're just functionally stable. And this is called the functional redundancy hypothesis that came out of this, that, that doesn't really matter that we all have these different bugs. They're all doing the same thing. If they're living in human gut, they're selected to have certain 
capabilities. Um, and I thought there just had to be more to it than that, and that maybe the problem was that we were looking at pathways at a very high level, and that if we drilled down into individual genes in those pathways or genes within specific bacterial species or strains, that we wouldn't see such stability. So with those four ideas in mind, we've spent uh, more time than I like over the last seven or eight years now trying to figure out how to take this sequencing experiment, this metagenomic sequencing experiment, and get inferences that are comparable across samples and, and, and make sense. And we're not the only ones. We and others have identified a number of different sources of bias or various kinds of challenges in quantifying this type of data. I'm going to briefly summarize them here, um, and then I'm going to tell you about one or two examples in more detail. So some of them relate to the experiment itself. So how you handled the sample, and in particular, how you extract the DNA. There's different kits, and it turns out some of them really enrich for the Firmicutes, for example. So how you prepare your library, and then these kind of biases, which you might be familiar with from other types of genomics, that different sequencers have different kinds of error patterns, that there's um, a preference to, se to sequence sequences that are near the median GC content of a genome, and if you have a really high or really low GC content in a region of the genome, it gets less coverage. So those same things are going on here. On top of that, we found that some of what were really well-intentioned bioinformatic filters and processes that people were putting this data through were inducing some bias themselves. And so if two studies processed, sort of cleaned their data in different ways, that this could induce bias. And then finally, um, what I've been focusing on in my examples up till now, things related to how you would take the reads from one of these experiments and go to a more meaningful statistic that would represent the amount of a gene or of a species in a sample and be comparable across samples. How can you do that without error? So um, the good news is these biases, these experimental biases exist. They're very important. Um, but their magnitude is relatively small compared to biological effects like disease and healthy or um, different ages of individuals. So they, they shouldn't be ignored, but they can also be adjusted for in statistical models. So if they're carefully tracked, and they rarely are, but if they are carefully tracked along with the sequencing data, one could also adjust for them like you would for any other kind of batch effect. Um, so we and others are making a big push that the databases that are hosting all these sequences should also be hosting this experimental metadata. In terms of quality control, this was sort of a mixed bag. Some of these things help, many of them don't. The biases that they induce are relatively small, but the problems they fix aren't so bad either, it turns out. And so in, depending on what you're trying to do with the downstream analysis, in many cases it turns out you can actually kind of skip a lot of this QC. Um, and that's good news because it's quite computationally intensive. So that was sort of a surprising result. Um, I w I'm not trying to say you should never do it, but some of it's uh, actually kind of overkill and induces more bias than it fixes. And, um, and it's a lot of work. So if you can do just about as well without doing it, then that's good news. The quantification is harder. So sometimes it's not so bad, but some of the biases that um, I, I showed you already, you saw were huge, that between studies or there were huge differences or some certain genes seemed to be just really at the top of lists that shouldn't be, that kind of thing. And so there, there's some hard problems here, and that's where we've spent most of our time. You, I alluded to already that you need to think about the length of genes. What you might not have been familiar with and I hadn't thought about, having mostly worked on single organisms like the human genome, is that the length of the genomes in a metagenome, in a microbial community that you study, actually matters. Um, and I'm going to explain why um, on the next slide. The quantification that you get of genes or taxa that you know something about, those hits to the database, are also heavily influenced by how much novel stuff there is in your sample. And um, 
in particular, if you use statistics that are based on the percent of reads that hit, say, a gene or a taxonomic group. So people will typically take the coverage of a gene or a genome, divide that by the whole library size, and use that as a relative abundance, a measure of the relative amount of a given taxonomic group in a sample. But if you have a ton of unknown stuff in one sample and less of it in another sample, then the relative amounts are getting juggled all over the place, and they're just completely uncomparable between samples. This is totally unappreciated in this research field. Um, we have a review coming out about this now um, and have been speaking about it as much as possible at conferences. It's just not intuitive if you're not used to thinking about this kind of data. It wasn't for us, but um, you can just totally get the wrong answer if you don't think about it. All right. So um, sorry to be such a downer. <laughs> and I know I've said a lot of negative things. Um, but what I, I hope you'll see in the next few slides is that there are some solutions to these problems. And in fact, in thinking about them, we also ended up moving in some research directions we didn't expect to and discovering some interesting biology that we wouldn't have thought about if we hadn't been thinking about all this annoying stuff. So. Um, let me tell you one example. There's a lot here, and I'm not going to go into all of them. I want to tell you about genome size, um, because I think this one's kind of interesting um, and uh, it goes beyond what you have to think about in a single organism genomics setting. So here's, here's the issue. If you have a sample with longer genomes in it compared to some other sample, and this can happen for a variety of reasons. Genome size varies across the tree of life. Um, you could have, um, in an extreme case, uh, a lot of eukaryotes, for example, in a sample that would have orders of magnitude bigger genomes than in some other sample. And you imagine just jacking up the amount of eukaryotes a little bit really changes, sucks up a bunch of your sequencing library. Or if you're studying the human microbiome, if you get a bit more host DNA, in the sample, that's going to suck up a ton of your sequencing library. So if you have larger genomes, you're going to have a lower expected coverage of any other, any given gene or taxonomic group in the sample. So if there's a bigger target out there that you're trying to sequence, then the expected coverage is lower. So that if you look at the number of reads that are hitting a taxonomic group or a gene in a sample with larger genomes, it's going to be lower. It doesn't mean there's less of that gene or less of that taxonomic group. There could be the exact same amount. And that means that sample would have systematically lower abundance estimates. If you didn't think about the size of the genomes, you might think that was some biological effect, that there were, there was a less of a particular bacterium or of a particular gene in those samples. Um, and uh, we think this is what was going on in some of the troubling, part of what was going on at least in some of the troubling examples I showed you at the beginning. And the reason is that genome size really does vary in different, across microbial communities. So here's three studies. This is genome size on the vertical axis. These are the studies. It doesn't matter too much what they are, but you can see that there's statistically significant and systematic differences in the average size of the genomes in the microbes in this one versus this one versus this one. These were all healthy adults. Stool microbiomes should have been comparable. But this would make you think that something was going on. Now, if these weren't healthy adults and these were, say, my controls and these were disease groups, I would attribute this to the disease. And it, it wouldn't be. It would be because the genome sizes uh, were smaller here. That would make all of the genes look higher in these samples and all the taxonomic groups look higher. And so the most high ones would be my hits, and they would be total false positives. The same is true in disease. So these are controls, no disease and yes disease, inflammatory bowel disease study the individuals with disease have larger genome sizes. So that skews all of the taxonomic groups and all of the genes if you don't adjust for it. And then even in healthy people, the same person, but across different sites in their body, different parts, different microbiomes, different niches on their body, very different average genome sizes. So this sounds bad, um, but it turns out there's a really good <coughs> answer, a really easy way to deal with this. And that we came to by looking at that list of genes that were our false positives, those housekeeping genes. I mentioned the ribosome and how it should never vary between any sample because 
it's universal and it's single copy in every microbial genome. And so those are like built-in controls. If you're familiar with like spiking in a control to an experiment, these are like nature spiked in some controls for us already that we know should be equal across samples. So we can use the level of those genes to control for these differences in genome size. So the idea is that instead of calculating the relative amount, the percentage of my sequencing library that mapped to a particular gene or a particular microbe, I'm instead going to try to estimate gene copy number directly, and I'm going to use these single copy universal genes as internal controls. I know they shouldn't vary, so I can just look at how many reads I have in a given sample to a gene of interest compared to one of these single copy genes. If I know the single copy genes are one copy, and I see twice as many reads to some other genome, then I know on average in the cells in my community there's two copies per cell. Or if there's half as many, then I know that half of the cells have a copy. So this also allows you to estimate the average genome size, which is how I made the plots on the previous slide. Um, and the idea is that these um, uh, the amount of reads, the abundance of these single copy genes varies across samples, and the amount that it varies can be correlated um, with the genome size through simulations from genomes, where we generate metagenomes on the computer. We can look at what the correlation is. It should be perfect, except that they're not perfectly universal and perfectly single copy. Some genomes aren't complete, and so they might be missing a gene now and then. So we empirically figured out what these uh, weights and these regression coefficients should be. And that gave us an estimate of average genome size. And then from that, we can get a measure that we call RPKG. It's similar to what you do in RNA sequencing where you want an RPKM. This is reads per kilobase per genome, basically. So you're normalizing by the size of the genomes. But um, all, all this math can just be intuitively thought of as looking at the copy number of a gene compared to the copy number of these single copy genes, so the coverage of one versus the coverage of the other. Um, so it's pretty straightforward conceptually, and it's actually pretty easy to implement. Um, and this gives us um, values that are now comparable across samples, even when the genome sizes differ between them. Um, in a nice convergence of thought that helped confirm we were on the right track, Elhanan Bornstein's lab came to a very identical solution at the same time we met at a meeting and, and published our papers in parallel. So um, I hope that story um, gave you a little bit of hope compared to my downer slide. Um, the theme in the lab is that we identify these sources of error by using simulations and also experimental procedures where we can generate gold standards. Figuring out what the error is helps us develop a new method. We implement those in open source software. And that allows us to correct our inferences, like adjusting for genome size. But it also lets us look at some new questions, because we think of something. We weren't even thinking about the size of the genomes in samples as something interesting to look at. But because we were working on it as a source of bias, it allowed us to also ask if genome size was interesting biologically. As an example, then. Um, it turned out average genome size is a great biomarker, a better one than the amount of firmicutes or some other taxonomic marker. So it's associated with a variety of diseases, not with obesity, um, and also with the presence of particular microbes. In particular, the microbes in samples that have larger genomes, when you get a larger average genome size in a sample, so that would be over here. This histogram at the top is the size of average size of the genomes that we estimated for different human microbiome samples. When you have larger average genomes, you have uh, less of these particular genes. And um, what this means is that the organisms in those samples are generalists. They are, um, I'm sorry, you have more of these particular genes. And what that means is that those organisms are generalists. They have a lot of um, ways of doing sugar metabolism. They can adjust to different environments and um, adapt to getting their energy in different ways. Whereas individuals who have small average genome sizes tend to have microbes in them who transport in what they need. They can't make it. They are specialized to living in a particular environment. 
And I think that these um, characteristics are things that we can then follow up and understand how that interacts with the host biology. So that's sort of a silver lining to thinking about this hard computational problem, the statistical issue of how to normalize the samples, we also realized that the genome size itself was an interesting thing to look at. It was associated with some both sort of functional patterns and with disease. So um, for the rest of the talk, I want to tell you about mining publicly available microbiome data. So now that we are convinced um, that we have the tools to make data comparable across studies and across samples, it becomes possible to do big meta-analyses and to mine um, all the publicly available data that's out there. Now, here's a graph of uh, the short read archive at NCBI. You get a similar graph if you look at the EBI archive. Um, there was almost no shotgun metagenomics data until 2010, and then it's risen a lot to more than 120 terabytes uh, in 20. Uh, uh, at the present time. So um, there's a lot of data out there if you could make it comparable. Um, and just to show where some of the data comes from, it's from a lot of different case control studies, different diseases, um, individuals in different parts of the world. So this study looked at individuals in North America and in Peru. Um, even other organisms like non-human primates, there's a lot of mouse data and of course, many natural environments, but I'm gonna focus on host-associated, uh, mammal host-associated microbiomes today. So um, what we did um, was to use our tools, and the average genome size normalization is just one of them. That's the, a little piece of this. Um, but here are some of the other tools we've developed. I didn't go into the details of them, but they deal with a lot of the other issues with analyzing this data. Um, this tool quantifies protein abundance. This tool looks at strain level variation to drill down to individual strains and the genes inside of those strains. This tool is a web server where somebody who doesn't have bioinformatics skills can mine the results that we've already generated and search them. Um, we've compiled data from many different studies. We have a database of gene families and a database of genomes that are clustered into species with an operational definition. This allows us, with the various tools we've developed and others have developed, to quantify uh, the relative abundance in gene copy number. And then you can start asking questions about associations with where somebody lives or what they've eaten or uh, if they have a disease or not, including looking at individual genetic variants, individual single nucleotides and gene copy number variants that might be associated with disease, just like you would in human genetics, but now these are inside of individual microbial species and detected from the metagenome. So um, I want to share some of um, what I, uh, the results that I'm most excited about from um, sort of a biological perspective now um, and that we've gotten from doing this sort of data mining and, and meta-analysis. So the first one gets back to the question of functional stability. I showed you that analysis where there was huge taxonomic differences between different people, but it appeared that their microbes were doing exactly the same thing. Their pathways abundances were almost flatlined. Um, it turns out that when you drill down to individual genes, that indeed is not the case. And so the issue, one of the issues there at least, was that pathways are quite big entities to be analyzing. And even the most um, conserved housekeeping pathways tend to have some components that vary across different people's microbiomes. So let me explain this plot. These are different pathways. And the bar plots are the number of genes in that pathway. So the height is just how big the pathway is. Some of them have more genes in them than others. And then the colors in the stacked bar plot tell you whether a gene was um, invariable or variable across hosts um, or not significant in a statistical test that Patrick Bradley um, developed. So um, you can see even something like central carbon metabolism, which is a very conserved housekeeping pathway, there are some genes that vary a lot in their abundance from one person to another. An example um, that shows 
uh, what's going on with an individual pathway is shown here. So these are secretion systems. Microbes use these to take proteins and other products outside of their own cell. So this is the inside of the bacterial cell here and directly inject them with these cannon like things into host cells. So um, colored here again with blue for not variable across hosts and red for variable across hosts at different significance cutoffs. You can see that within this pathway, there are a collection of genes that are variable and invariable. But the invariable genes are in these TAT and SEC components here. And these particular components that do the injecting into the host cells are the ones that have variable parts. Even in these two, the type 3 and type 6 secretion systems, there are invariable genes, like the ones that sit here in the membrane. But the ones that are doing the injecting and the ones that are communicating here inside the bacterial cell are very variable, significantly variable in their abundance across different hosts. So if one had just analyzed this as a secretion systems, you wouldn't see anything. It would just be a mixed bag, and it would, the, the invariable and the variable would kind of cancel out, and you'd get that flat lining that I showed before that's not very interesting. So yes, all our microbiomes have secretion systems, um, and that is true. Um, and indeed, they are about equally abundant in all of us. But we vary a lot in terms of what specifically those secretion systems are doing, and that's probably what's really important to the host. We also saw something interesting. So I'd mentioned the Firmicutes, another really prevalent phylum of bacteria um, in the human microbiome are the um, Bacteroidetes. Um, a much less prevalent phylum are the proteobacteria. These have rarely been discussed as a biomarker or as something interesting to pay attention to. But what we found by drilling down to individual genes and figuring out what taxonomic groups they came from was that the proteobacteria were a big source of this variability, not the taxonomic groups that had initially been focused on. Um, and so there are some variable genes that are attributable to these uh, more prevalent phyla, but the proteobacteria um, contribute a disproportionate number and are associated with inflammation and a variety of other interesting traits from the perspective of the host um, immunology. And so it makes a lot of sense, but they've been underappreciated in this field because they're like less prevalent and less abundant. Once we've drilled down to individual genes and genetic variants inside of each species of microbe, we can ask whether um, not just whether we differ from one another in what we have, but whether that associates with something about us. And one of the things we looked at was whether it was associated with where you're from. So here are some of, in red, some of the locations where metagenomic studies with publicly available data have been done. The, um, this is a phylogenetic tree relating the strains of this particular bacterium, Eubacterium rectale, based on the genetic variants that are found in different people's microbiome. And so the, each person, each metagenome is a dot on this tree, and the color represents where the host lived. And I sort of you know, rotated the tree around so that it corresponded with the map, but that's just for visual. The main thing is the tree, which shows that um, the green and the blue dots, which represent people from North America and Europe, are clustered together. There's two clades, so it's two main groups of strains, sort of what we call type 1 and type 2 strains of this bacterium, and that they're mixed, you know, that people from Europe and North America tend to have one or the other. But these are quite distinct phylogenetically from the strains in China and in Ter Peru and in Tanzania. And so um, this suggests that where you're from, has something to do with the microbes that you have. It relates to a hypothesis you might be familiar with called the hygiene hypothesis that suggests that these folks in Africa and Tanzania living lifestyles more like our ancestors might have the ancestral microbiome and that these might be um, uh, strains that have evolved more recently and um, have adapted to um, the lifestyle with antibiotics, cleaning products, dental care, uh, processed food in the diet, et cetera. Um, and that this sort of clean lifestyle could actually be associated with the rise of autoimmune disease, which is much higher in these two parts of the world. So that's a hypothesis that we and, and many others are pursuing. Our results show that you might be able to link that to particular genes and particular strains. 
It's not every bacterium, though. So you might think, OK, that's just, you know, you get your microbiome from your mom or your dad. And of course, it's similar for people that live near each other. Um, but here's another bacteria, Bacteroides uniformis. And here's its tree. It's a big star phylogeny with a mix of dots from all over the world. So your Bacteroides um, uniformis might look most similar to somebody in China's. Um, but that wouldn't have been true for um, the Eubacterium rectale. So different bacteria have different population structure. We have an ongoing study that I want to tell you about, about um, looking um, in a specific disease model. This is a dominant negative receptor for TGF-beta. And this mouse model um, is in the lab of my colleague, Shomi Sanjabi. Um, she worked on it when she was a postdoc um, with Flavel at Yale. And she's interested in it for a variety of reasons related more directly to the human immune system. But we wanted to ask whether these mice, um, who are um, in the same litters with healthy controls but differ in this genetic mutation that generates inflammatory bowel disease, have different microbiomes or not. It's nice to work in a mouse model because we can monitor the mice from birth through the disease process. And then we can potentially do experimental manipulations to try to figure out what's going on. This allows us to get it cause and effect, which is much harder to do in those big human population-based studies. You can see here that the um, IBD mouse, the ones with the dominant negative receptor for TGF-beta, get this activation of their T cells very consistently at seven weeks. And they begin to, uh, they stop gaining weight compared to the wild type mice. So that's the disease kicking in. And the question is, what's going on with the microbiome? So we did shotgun sequencing on a weekly basis. Um, so far, we've analyzed every other week's samples, the ones with the errors there and looked at individual genes and individual microbes with the tools that I described so far. And here's just a few examples. We found a number of individual uh, genes and um, microbes that were different between the, the DNR and the wild type mice. And this was in a pretty small pilot study with just a sm pretty small sample size of mice, about five mice in each group. So even without a lot of power, we found some consistent results. So here's just a couple of examples. We found a lot of things. This is. Um, glutathionine transport. Um, glutathionine is an antioxidant. And you can see, um, so this is the whole module. This is that high pathway level view. And then these are individual gene families in it. You can see they have a pretty consistent, all the genes in this pathway are moving together in this case. And that there's this uptick in the abundance of them um, in the DNR mice uh, after the disease process sets in. So this probably isn't causing disease. It may be reacting, the microbiome reacting to the disease. Um, but it's a very consistent pattern. In this example, which is um, sulfate reduction, um, there are some genes that aren't very abundant. And then there's these two components here. These are two subunits of the adenyl transferase. It's also found in assimilatory sulfate reduction. And um, they are um, also increasing in the DNR mice over time, the ones with the dominant negative receptor for TGF-beta. So those are just a few examples of, in, of things that we can find. Another study that we're involved in um, is, again, using public, this is back to publicly available data. Um, this study by Backhead and colleagues that came out um, in 2015 looked at Swedish mothers and their infants over the first year of life. And shotgun sequenced the mother um, and the infant right after the infant's birth. And then the infant, again, at um, several time points um, after birth. And what they reported in the paper, and I'm reproducing here in our own data analysis, is that over time, the species in the infant, so this is the infant's microbiome and how many shared species it has with its own mother, over time, that increases. So what was sort of um, we and others had inferred was that there was a constant amount or maybe even an increasing amount of vertical transmission of the microbes from the mom over to the infant over time, sort of an accumulation of her microbiome in the infant who's born without much of a microbiome. That's what it looks like. But we then randomized, we permuted the infants with somebody else's mother, and we saw the exact same trend. And so it's not a sign necessarily of vertical transmission. It just may mean that the infant microbiome is maturing over time and looking more like an adult microbiome, but not necessarily that the microbes are coming from the mom. They could be coming from any number of other sources. 
So we thought that our strain level tools might help to detect this because if there was a vertical transmission and if the mother's um, strain had genetic mutations like kind of rare SNPs or copy number variants, then we could detect if the strain was actually passed to the infant if we saw those same genetic variants in the infant. But if we saw the same species but without the genetic variants, it probably came from somewhere else. So we used our tools to identify single nucleotide polymorphisms and gene copy number polymorphisms in a whole collection of prevalent bacteria in the adult microbiomes. And then we um, looked to see what genetic variants they had. We found mutations that were unique to a mom that she was the only person in the study that had them. We also looked in all our big database of publicly available data and made sure that they weren't common in other individuals either. So these are very rare or maybe even unique to that person. And then we asked whether the infant had them. And what we saw was the exact opposite trend, that in fact the most vertical transmission of strains happens right at birth, and that those species that the infant's picking up over time are not the same strains. They don't carry the genetic variants of their own mother. They could be coming from some other body site on her. All we had in this publicly available data set was her stool, so that suggests some interesting hypotheses you could follow up in another study. Um, they could be coming from other adults. They could be coming from food that the infant's increasingly eating over this year, any number of other exposures, the playground, et cetera. If anyone has a kid, you know there's lots of them. So. Um, it was really important to drill down to the strain level, or you would have made probably the assumption that the infant was getting these from the mom, because that's what it looked like. So I just want to summarize um, the research part of the talk with um, a few high-level points. So the first one is that it's really important to think about how to quantify this data, as with any new technology. So it's sort of a general lesson. It's not specific to metagenomics. So some of the complications, like this genome size stuff, are very specific to metagenomics. And modeling that would account for the features of the data that you might not be thinking about. The second is that there's a massive amount of variation in our microbiomes, not just at the taxonomic level, but there really is massive functional variation, too. But it's missed if you analyze the data sets at too high of a resolution at pathway level. You need to drill down. It's really down even below the species level at individual strains and the genes that they carry, which are different from one person to another. And finally, by looking at longitudinal studies, I think we've seen um, some really interesting results that there's relative stability in healthy adults. I didn't show you the data for that, but the, the moms just like any other adult, um, are probably stable over time. In the Human Microbiome Project and in some of these other studies, these people were sampled repeatedly over time. And when you see the same, in an adult, where you see the same species at two different time points, it is the same strain um, most of the time. So there's this stability of the strains in healthy adults. But we see a much more dynamic situation in early development and in autoimmune disease, and I would guess maybe in other diseases as well. So this is something very exciting to follow up. So um, before taking questions, I wanted to switch to a moment of career advice. I was asked to tell you briefly about my career and, and um, um, a word of wisdom for the folks in the lab or in the room who are still thinking about careers. So the, my advice for you is that your field may not exist today. And maybe you've heard this before. You probably have if you're interested in computational immunology, because at Stanford it didn't exist. I just learned three years ago. So this isn't surprising. But um, you may be doing something even more different from computational immunology a decade from now, or even a few years from now. I feel like my career has constantly changed. And so to give you some perspective on that, let me tell you what I did as an undergrad. I was doing this. So I was studying bones and primate behavior and math, which was really helpful, it turned out. But that was kind of on the side. Um, and um, you might think this had no relevance to what I'm doing now, but I don't think that's true. I think, I, as I mentioned, we're looking at people from different parts of the world. We're thinking about the evolution of the human microbiome. I didn't tell you, but we're doing a study comparing the microbiomes of humans and non-human primates. Um, and so this is still present in my research, but it's pretty different from what I'm doing now. The thing I thought was most interesting in my anthropology classes was at the time people had sequenced a few genes. There was no human genome at that time. Of, and um, 
using data from just a couple of genes, people were trying to speculate, um, looking at the genetic variants in Native Americans compared to Siberians, Europeans, Africans, trying to figure out how people got to North America and when it happened. And I thought that was really interesting. But it was, it was like a very young field and, and very basic compared to population genomics today. Um, so I left that for a while and I worked in public health, lived all over the world, worked on sudden infant death, um, housing issues, health issues, epidemiology and public health. Then I went to grad school, and this happened because I realized everywhere I went, people had me fix the computer or tinker with the database, and I, I actually have a skill here that other people don't have. Maybe I ought to develop this. Um, and so I went to grad school and got into statistical genomics. The human genome was sequenced while I was in grad school, and so this shifted me really rapidly from public health into genomics. Um, but I didn't go to grad school thinking I was going to work on genomics. I went to grad school thinking I was going to work on epidemiology. Um, but I couldn't help but be excited about the sequencing of the human genome. And I wrote my thesis about um, the methods for analyzing DNA microarrays, which were a big new technology at that time. Then we got other genomes. And so I was a postdoc at UC Santa Cruz, which became one of the warehouses for here are keel genomes. And I worked on those a little bit. So you can see a little micro creeping in, but not much yet. I mostly worked on comparing the human genome to the chimp genome and finding the fastest evolving regions of the, chimp, of the human genome and uh, learning that those weren't genes, but gene regulatory enhancers. And that's still an, an active research area in my lab, actually. Um, and then how did I end up working on comparative metagenomics? Well, I was sitting there giving a talk um, at UC Davis about what makes humans different from chimps, and my friend and colleague Jonathan Eisen, who's a microbiologist, said, you know, most of the DNA in your body isn't from the human genome. And he was sort of mocking me, and I was like, oh, that's kind of cool, whatever, and ignored him. And then he kept bringing it up over and over again, and I said, this guy is really persistent. Maybe I should pay attention to him. And I started sort of doing some reading about this field, and I thought, oh my god, I've been looking under this lamppost at the human DNA, and there's like all these other proteins in our body, and they're doing stuff like injecting stuff into the human cells and training the immune system. Okay, I need to pay attention to this. So it's only been a little less than a decade that we've been working on this, um, but it's now more than half of my lab, and, and obviously I'm really excited about it. So I don't know what I'm going to be doing five or ten years from now, um, and, and you probably don't either if you're the kind of person who's in the room today. Um, so how do you end up doing something cool instead of being one of those? Because there's are people who kind of wander from one thing to another and never get anywhere very exciting um, or aren't very happy with their wandering. So how do you get somewhere that you're happy with? I think you really have to listen to your own interests. This was really important for me at each stage. Something caught my attention like, oh, the human genome was sequenced. Oh, that seems pretty cool. And oh my god, there's these microbe cells in the body. Um, so pay attention to what catches your attention. Explore new technologies and new areas. But don't forget about your past. I feel like the perspective I bring to microbiome research is really different than a microbiologist's perspective or different from a genomics person's perspective because I've done this comparative anthropology and because I've thought about evolution. Um, and so a lot of the approaches in our lab, I showed you one example, involved like drawing phylogenetic trees and developing methods that use the phylogenetic trees. So, um, when you feel like you're jumping around from one thing into another, you might not realize now, but some of the skills you're picking up are going to be really useful downstream. I, I can definitely vouch for that. All right, so I want to thank the folks that did the work. This is the metagenomics team in the lab. Um, Patrick worked on the variable genes. Um, Svetlana worked on the DNR mouse model. Nandita worked um, on the human mother data set. Josh's work I didn't present because he works mostly on microbes in the ocean and in soils. Um, and Stephen did a lot of the work, the heavy lifting that I talked about on quantification and software tools um, and was a major player in pretty much everything that I showed today. So I specifically want to really thank him for his hard work. He's uh, graduating soon. Um, so thank you, and thank you also to the funding sources. I'm happy to take questions from here and from UCSF. Questions?
Yeah, it's good to see UCSF people on there. We're here. Hi. Uh, Marina, um, if there are any questions from your side, please let, let us know. Did I have Doesn't look like it. Now. Oh, you do? Okay, there's a question. Hi. Hi, Katie. Thanks so much for chatting. Um, I'm sure I'm in a more team with Sergio and Matt Stefan, and heard a lot about the wonderful work that you do. So thanks for giving this one for talk. My question is you mentioned the advantage of using genomic size when comparing an expression, so looking at reads per kilobase per average genome size. Yes. Can you give examples where applying that approach has made a difference in interpretation of data and in what circumstances you find that extremely useful? Yeah, so um, it makes a big difference if the taxonomic composition of the samples is different. And um, that's frequently the case. So I showed some. Um, box plots of disease like the Crohn's, uh, the IBD versus healthy individuals, the Crohn's versus healthy individuals. Um, we've definitely seen it in comparing, um, so it was very important there when there's differences in genome size between disease groups and it was a confounder. And when we did the genome size adjustment, much more interesting and meaningful results came out rather than um, what I think were the result of just bias in the data sets. It was also really important in making, for example, the um, phylogenetic trees I showed of the strain level variation um, between uh, the metagenomes of people in different parts of the world because to do that, we were grabbing publicly available data from different studies and there were these systematic biases including average genome size uh, differences between the studies. And if you didn't um, adjust the gene copy numbers by the copy number of the universal single copy genes, you would lose those signals. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, question here? Hi. Uh, I would like you, um, if you could elaborate a little bit on the theory that you presented with the phylogenetic trees and some species which like appear globally and others which are confined to a certain continent. And do you observe any patterns on which species are more confined and which species are more global? Or that's really interesting. Actually. Yeah, that's a great question. So this is a pretty new result. We haven't dug into it as much as I want to yet. Um, but I'll tell you a couple of observations. So um, first, um, a theory we had that didn't pan out. We thought maybe the microbes that showed more population structure would also be the ones that were vertically transmitted from the moms to the babies. Because if you get it from your mom at birth, then it's more likely to sort of follow where you're from, given that until recently, most people kind of live near where their mom was from. So um, uh, we haven't done this systematically yet. But the, um, for example, the Eubacterium rectale that I showed that had a lot of structure globally, when we looked at it in the mom-baby data set, that was one of the species that did increase in the infant over time, but was not the strain from the mom. So maybe they're getting it somewhere else in their local environment, um, and we need to dig into that more. Um, but that um, is one hypothesis we have, that the amount of vertical transmission would relate to the population structure. So far, we haven't seen that, but we're just starting to look at it. The next question is whether it's sort of functional. So if you do that tree with SNPs, are they variants that were sort of selected for in one environment compared to the other? Um, or gene copy number variations, what are the functions of those genes that are maybe missing in one part of the world and present in another part of the world? We are seeing some functional enrichments for the genes that are found in the industrialized countries compared to the other places. Um, and uh, we're just digging into that more, too. So it's a great question, and we're actively working on it. Yeah. Conversely, do you see functional losses? Yeah, some of them are losses. So actually, um, uh, I should clarify that in most cases they are losses because we're looking losses compared to a reference genome. So we're compare we're looking at genes that we've seen ever in a genome before, and so it's hard if if there was a gain of a gene that we've never seen before we would miss that. Um, so there's actually a bias towards finding losses um, compared to the reference database, um, and uh, but we also do see so. Back to the hygiene hypothesis that there's maybe a more diverse 
an ancestral microbiome and the individuals that haven't been exposed to antibiotics and processed food, et cetera. Um, we do see higher diversity um, in those samples and um, genetic variants that you never see outside of Africa and Peru. And, um, so um, we think that there's also loss, there is also loss in the industrialized countries. So it goes both ways. Um, it's harder to detect that because most of the microbes in the database were obtained from someone in North America or Europe. So we, um, I don't think I have this slide here, but we um, asked how well the database covers the diversity of microbiomes from different environments, including hosts in different parts of the world. And the, it turns out that um, of, at the species level, that the, the um, majority of species in a North American person's microbiome actually are detectable. They're in the database. But um, it's not the majority if you go to someone in Africa or Tanzania. So we're very biased, just like human genetics was for a long time, like the SNP chips were really biased towards variants that were in North Americans and Europeans. And we're now saying, oh, we ought to look at all this genetic variation that's elsewhere in the world. Um, interestingly, and maybe really important for immunologists since mouse models are used a lot, the mouse stool microbiome, which is sort of at a high taxonomic level similar to the human, um, at, when you drill down, it's only about 10% of the taxa there are detectable in the mouse microbiome compared to like 60 plus, you know, 50, 60% in the human microbiome. So there's a lot of stuff in the mouse that's different actually from the human. Um, so that's a bit troubling. Um, for us and others who are doing mouse studies. I mean, there's sort of pros and cons to working with mice, but you have to keep in mind the microbiome is much less well characterized. Um, it's on the same or, uh, uh, level in terms of how well we know it um, to soil or ocean samples. Yeah. Are you able to distinguish between, um, at the strain level, where you gain a microbe that has a SNP versus the microbe in your microbiome acquiring the SNP? It's a great question. So are these variants that are maybe unique to a host de novo mutations in that host or not? Um, so we're looking at that. Nandita, actually, who's, uh, well, I don't have my slide up anymore, but Nandita um, Gurud was a grad student in population genetics here at Stanford, and she's now in my lab and is interested in that question. She'd worked on Drosophila, and she was assuming most of it was new mutations that would arise in the population. Um, but um, it looks like um, a lot of them are pretty old mutations, that there's sort of an more ancient structure. Um, and um, we're very interested in that question. We're still trying to elucidate, like, for which genes and which microbes is it recent versus old? Yeah. And we're using some phylogenetic approaches to get at that. We haven't do finished doing it systematically yet. Yeah. Yeah. What, what kind of stuff? Uh, oh, oh, yeah, one back there and then you. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, for the, the baby data set, where yeah. the babies get put on solid food because their food changes a lot. Yeah. Yeah, so the, um, their food source was monitored, like the amount of breast milk versus solid food. Also, some of them were cesarean versus um, vaginal birth. The birth mode affects the microbiome, um, as does the transition to food. But those were adjusted for in the analysis that I described. So um, not, not, nothing about them sort of predicted the amount of transfer from the mom. That pattern that I showed was sort of consistent across the groups. Um, but it, 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 it is true that um, the food source and the birth mode have an effect on the microbiome. Yes? What kind of stuff does the, does the microbiome inject in the host cells anymore? Yeah, so all kinds of stuff, proteins, small molecules. Um, of secretion systems. So they're used to go in the host cells. There's other secretion systems that go into ba other bacterial cells. They can be used for both good information, like, hey, let's like get together and do something, and they can be used to try to kill the other cells. So um, they're, they're, they have a variety of, just like sort of cells in the immune system can have be inflammatory or anti-inflammatory, the, the, the way secretion systems use, are used is very variable. So it can be used for trying to kill other cells or do other what, things. What would be an example of like, just one simple example of uh, a sort of a beneficial or good or whatever 
Um, quorum sensing. So when bacteria get together and try to form, make a biofilm and stop operating like individual entities and start to operate more like a multicellular organism with distinct roles in the biofilm, where if you're in the middle versus the edge, you're expressing different genes and you're responding, you have a different role in the community, or maybe you like metabolizing different things and excreting them and then sharing them with your neighbors, secretion systems play a big role there. Yes. Yeah. Did you just mention that um, birth mode had no effect on the degree of vertical transmission early on in your study? Right. So um, let me clarify that. Um, birth mode um, does change the species level composition. So when you're vaginally born, you, of course, pick up microbes from the birth canal. Compared to cesarean section, you pick up microbes that are more similar to the skin. Um, but um, we didn't observe a, a, a difference in the amount of vertical transmission. I should say there were only a small number of cesarean-born infants in the study, and we didn't really have a lot of power either. So I, I guess we, we didn't find anything, but it doesn't mean that there's not something there. If that's the case, can you then rule out that some baby mom pairs are simply receiving from a third source, third shared source, where others are not? Um, vertical, direct vertical transmission from one to the other? Yeah, I mean, it has to be a third source, essentially, because the infant's microbiome is getting more diverse. They're acquiring more microbes over time. Like the, oh, at the early time point, yeah. There's no difference between vaginal and cesarean, uh -huh. which is the only thing that differs in terms of the level of contact. Mm -hmm. and what it's, well, so the samples weren't taken right after the birth. They were at four days. There's been other contact as well. Some breastfeedings probably happened and other things. So um, yeah, I don't think. Um, I don't think we really know the answer to your question. I think it's a really good question. But um, you would need a, other data that wasn't collected in this study, basically. But our results suggest what data you ought to collect, basically. Like, I think if you really wanted to get to the bottom of this, you would do more than sequence the mom. You'd look at some of the other sources, including other body sites on her, like the breast milk, skin, et cetera. So they just did the stool um, of the mom and only at one time point. So we inferred what we could from that. But I think you're asking the right questions. So, someone, if not us, someone else ought to collect that data. Yeah. One more question, yeah. Yeah. In terms of the microbiome stability, yeah. you mentioned that that's relatively stable in healthy individuals. Yes. But that might predict um, emerging diseases. Yes. Or did I understand that? That's right. So what, what types of diseases are. are so. Almost every disease that's been examined so far has sick people have a different microbiome than healthy controls in almost every, I mean, there's a study almost every week. So the question is whether that's cause or effect, I think, and that's why we were doing this longitudinal study in IBD. Um, one of the things that you see consistently is, in general in disease is a lower diversity of the microbiome, which suggests in the sick people something's blooming and the relative amounts of other things are going down. So that's kind of like the hygiene hypothesis that you're losing healthy microbes. It also could happen in disease state that something that probably shouldn't be so abundant is blooming. Um, but again, whether that's cause or effect you know, requires further study. But that is a consistent pattern. We are doing a meta-analysis right now to see if the things that are blooming are the same across diseases or whether that's a biomarker for the disease. Um, but I don't have the answer to that yet. Yeah. Um, I want to thank Dr. Pollard for the wonderful talk. Thank you, guys.